This is going to be controversial, but you know what? F it. Meet Aline Tamir, digital nomad, content creator, aka Dear Aline, and one of the few women to own a luxury hotel in the Maldives. She is here to tell you that you too can reinvent your life. I was religiously Mormon. I was raised with this judgmental, constant narrative. Don't do this, don't do that. This is bad, this is good. Everything's black and white, everything's right and wrong. Some people are happy in religion, but I was not. I was like a muted version of myself. At a normal university, you can sleep with 10 people a day and your education is not affected. At my university, your morality can affect your entire future. I was so anxious, I was never happy. Rebranding is what I've been doing lately. You're gonna lose people in the rebrand. I'm kind of done with my content here. You didn't have sex with your husband yeah. for the first three years. Yeah, we never had sex. I was so anxious on my wedding night and I was so dreading it and I was just like, Hello, my fellow leaders. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm an executive headhunter, career coach, and host of the show. Here, we talk about how to find your calling, how to succeed in business, and how to live well whilst doing so. I am bringing Anatomy of a Leader live to a venue in London. If you'd like to be the first to find out about it, please make sure that you follow the link in the show notes to be added to the waitlist. And don't forget to subscribe or follow the show wherever you're listening. Aline. Hello. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was nice to meet you only a couple of days ago, and I didn't even realize it's your birthday. It was. So you happy met me birthday. on my birthday. Thank you. <laughs> when my husband's doing a photo shoot with you. So amazing. Beautiful. That was perfect. He took the best pictures on my birthday. It was just like really nice. It's nice to take pictures on your birthday because yeah. then you can look back and be like, oh, I turned this age. I turned that age. Well, so. just like commemorate the moment and, and make it more memorable. Yeah. And he did such a good job because as I get older, like, I sometimes don't like how I look on camera and so it was really nice to take pictures and like feel nice after and not just be like ultra critical so. yeah he's yeah. very good with that because sometimes I'm like can I have a photo and on the iPhone he'll take a picture and I'm like oh I'm not quite there but then yeah. he'll have like a camera and I'm not really kind of focusing or he's like oh I'm only doing like you know I'm just testing the light and those are like the best the good pictures ones, when you're, you're like natural. relaxed and like he'll pick the right angle but um, anyway happy birthday and wonderful to meet you and very much looking forward to getting to know you thank you I'm looking forward to it as well <laughs> so for the audience for the listeners yes. who don't know who you are just a very quick background you know you were you're a digital nomad going through a bit of a transition yes but uh, <laughs> yeah so just a, a quick background as to who you are Sure. So essentially, I was raised in Los Angeles in the school years. And in the summers, I would go to Israel because my mom is American and grew up in L.A. And my dad is Israeli and Jewish. My mom is Mormon, which is a type of super Christian religion. And dad is Jewish, which is a very strange combination uh, there's not a lot of us on earth that are half and no, half. No, that is very strange <laughs> and uh, complicated. Very complicated. Dynamic. Very, but there's a lot of things, you know. There's my, my upbringing was like definitely unusual. And so I think that kind of colored a lot of my life. My parents separated when I was 12. I stayed mostly in LA with my mom. Um, I was religiously Mormon. So I was that religion very much growing up. And um, until I went to university at Brigham Young University, which is a Mormon-only university, really, pretty much. Um, I got married in my religion when I was 22, so right after I graduated, to another person in my religion. Um, we were together for three years. We actually started a content company. So we did a video creation company. Uh, our license plate on our car was YouTube, and this was all like 15 years ago. Wow. And just always loved content. And I always loved media since I was young. I grew up in LA. So I was like, wow, the movies. But because I was a girl and I didn't think I was like that pretty, I was like, oh, I'll never be in the movies. So maybe I can at least be behind the scenes. But behind the scenes 15 years ago was 95% men. And even at my film school programs, it was like male directors. There was one female in my high school that was like a producer, but she was also a lesbian. So she had like very masculine energy. So just subconsciously, I was like, oh, I cannot be in media because I'm not a pretty girl and I'm not a guy, right? So I would just do like casting or like even just the food part. I was like, oh, I can do food, craft services, right? 
Um, and then social media started existing and I was like, ah, maybe I can do media, but in this way, it kind of created more opportunities. So me and my ex had a content company together and we would make videos for like big companies like Sony or Pizza Hut. And they would come to us and be like, here's a budget. We want a viral video that goes viral with no ad spend. So it's all organic marketing. And so I learned a lot about organic content creation. Then we got divorced when I was 25 in that year. That was like the year that changed my whole life direction. So up until that point, I was very religious, never drank alcohol, um, never had coffee or, or tea with caffeine, um, dressed like pretty modestly, like went to church three hours every Sunday. Very, very religious, like very. Uh, and then I realized I wasn't happy and I was kind of living uh, somebody else's life. I was trying to make my mom happy and I was sacrificing my whole life to make somebody else happy. And I was kind of miserable. Uh, so slowly in that year, I left my religion. I like didn't go to church one day and I was like, oh, am I going to get struck by lightning? Am I going to get hit by a car? Cause I didn't go to church. And then three months later I had my first coffee and I was like, oh, I'm very hyper now. Um, and then I had my first alcohol. I was like, oh, am I gonna, am I gonna feel horrible? Like I was 27. I'd never done any of these things. Mm. Um, what what yeah. prompted you to start to make those changes? I think just like the, I, I, I felt like, you know, when you like play a game to completion. So in my religion, like the peak is you get married in the temple and I got married in the temple and I was miserable for three years. Like our marriage was miserable. Of course there's nice moments. We were friends, but it was just like not right. And I was trying so hard to be something I wasn't. I was trying so hard to be baking cookies and white picket fence and cute, nice wifey. And like, I'm not that person. <laughs> like mm. I'm just not. And it was just like, I don't know when you're raised in a certain way, you try to make your parents happy and your community happy. And it was, I was sacrificing like my soul essentially like the end of that marriage. I was, I felt like a shell. Like I felt like my whole personality was drained. Uh, it's not the other person's fault. It's my fault for putting myself in this situation. And it was, it was the, the greater picture. I felt like genuinely, like I will never be myself again. And I mm -hmm. thought I was like, I've, I've essentially killed myself like internally now I am myself. So now it's easy to be like, Oh my God, I have my sparkle back. I have my bubble back. But then I was really empty. Like mm -hmm. I just was so miserable and I just didn't think of divorce as an option because I was raised so religious. I was like, literally it felt almost like suicide was a better option than divorce. Genuinely like in my brain or murder, like it just mm -hmm. like anything but divorce. Right. So that was just where I finally felt like, you know what, I need to kind of live the life I want to live. In between the moment of getting married, which you say is the peak, to getting divorced, was this sort of gradual understanding that something's not quite right? Or where was the point when you're like, hold on, I'm living someone else's life, this is not me? I knew from the beginning. So I knew about three weeks before our wedding date, uh, my fiance and I were at my cousin's wedding and we had like this little argument at the table, the wedding table at the dinner. And he like reached under the table and like grabbed my skin and pinched it and twisted it really hard under the table. So no one could see, because I guess he was mad at something I said. It was, it was not anything like big. It wasn't anything crazy what I said. And at that moment, like something shifted in like my cellular structure where I was like, I cannot marry this person. Like my parents, you know, have their issues. They've never touched me. They've never touched me. Like, and I am a brat. <laughs> and if I was my parent, I would have been like silence, but they never touched me. And I was like my own parents who I'm a brat to never touched me. Who are you to like physically hurt me? And he felt really bad and he cried and he said he grew up and that's how his parents like you know, tried to keep him in line. So to him, it wasn't a big deal, but to me, it just shifted my whole body. And I already wasn't sure it was a good idea, but I was trying to do what's right. You know, when you're young, you don't know what's right. You're just trying your best. So I was just trying my best to be a good person. And I thought being a good person means marrying a good person and in the religion. And he was a good person. And 
that moment though, I knew, and I still got married anyways. Mm. Because if you didn't, what would be the re- repercussions to you then? Because I mean, that must be a big deal to not go through with it. I mean, now that I have a totally different life perspective, I'm like, you should do what's best for you. Don't worry about everyone. Back then I was a very limited mindset. I was like, oh my God, my family is coming from Texas or they're coming from Northern California to this wedding. They already planned things. They might've booked flights or planned their weekends off. And I was like, I can't inconvenience everybody by canceling my wedding, which is hilarious. I'm like, yeah, let me just inconvenience my entire life so that you don't have to change your weekend plans. That That's what I did. And I was like, oh, I don't want to like throw everyone off. And like, maybe I am just having cold feet. Like, you don't know. Maybe I'm having cold feet. Maybe none of it ever felt right. But at the same time, it was my first time Mm -hmm. doing life, right? I didn't know what's your brain playing tricks on you and what's intuition. Mm -hmm. And something I've talked with my therapist about a lot in the last few weeks and months is like the difference between intuition and like triggers, And back then I didn't have any guidance. I didn't know. So I just was like, I'm just going to do it. So what is the difference between intuition and triggers? So what she says is when you've had a kind of a traumatic upbringing, which a lot of us have, and I definitely have, um, you don't know how to trust. You shouldn't trust your intuition, right? Because always people say to us, right? They're like, just trust your, just the answers inside. Like, listen to your gut. Listen to your gut. And she's like, Aline, you shouldn't listen to your gut. <laughs> like, so she said, the difference for me, and maybe it's different for everyone, is if I turn quickly. So if I turn quickly, like, let's say I'm dating someone because I'm single now, I'm dating. So she's like, when you feel a certain way about someone and then one thing happens and you switch, that can be a, trigger it's not a gut feeling a gut feeling usually will kind of grow slowly it's not a perfect rule but that's helped me a lot so like Mm -hmm. if I'm dating someone and they do something like uh they I was dating someone and he messed up a rental car thing and I I I switched I was like this person's irresponsible they're not dependable how am I gonna have kids with someone who can't even arrange a rental car and she's like that's a trauma response trigger (laughs) right like Everyone makes mistakes. Everyone messes up rental cars. You don't need to turn on someone and be like, you're dead to me because they messed up a rental car reservation. Um, And then intuition is more, she's like, is it a repeated feeling? Is it something that when you're alone and and you're in stillness, you feel, right? As opposed to when you're with someone and something happens Mm. and you go a 180. So that's kind of helped me is like, is this a quick response or is it like a slow realization that feels very peaceful? This is make, giving me goosebumps, you know, because I think about this a lot because this whole like, listen to your gut, listen to your gut. But sometimes like my gut is telling me something, which is like this fear response, like this sort of, you know, like the end of the world. And it's like, oh, you're an asshole or, you know, and I'm like, but surely, but I don't always think like that of this person. And that's really useful. That's a really useful. Yeah, I way think to it is helpful to hear it. Because mm. I think it's amazing that people say to listen to your gut, and that is in general like good advice. Mm. But I think it is important to know that not everybody's gut um, like doesn't have a- other things influencing it. Yeah, and something that I also do because I know I I I I struggle trusting my intuition is I have a group chat with uh, seven of my closest girlfriends who are all, I respect their opinions a lot. And if I'm having an issue, if I'm meditating and I'm not getting an answer, if I'm feeling very stuck, I message the girls that I'm Mm. like, hey, here's a situation. What do you girls think? And then I have like this panel of very smart women who kind of say, hey, I think this is, uh, you, you should trust how you're feeling. And we agree. Or I have like Sometimes they'll say like, you know what, maybe you're kind of overreacting and like give it a bit of time and see Mm -hmm. how it goes. And just kind of without my natural gut reaction, my, without my natural gut kind of guidance, I created gut guidance with Mm. these women. (laughs) So Mm. it's been amazing. Yeah. I wonder if intuition is also tied when you follow along with what society tells you. So you stop listening to yourself. So then it's even harder to figure out, well, what's my intuition telling me? Because you're so used to listening for things like this is the template, this is how it's done, and not actually pay attention to those triggers or those negative feelings or, you know, this like niggling thing. So I wonder if the two are. 100%. I mean, my whole first 27 years were me 
reacting to society, my society, right? The, the religion that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that I allowed to kind of guide my entire existence and every behavior and every thought I had. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't working for me. Right. So the way society works, there's pros and cons. Like there's lots of good things in how society works. But I think, for example, the concept of like the pathway in life that a lot of people had in the fifties, right? You grow up, you go to college, maybe you get married, you have 2.5 kids, you have the picket fence. That's great for some people, but also for some people that is a recipe for absolute misery. Right. And so being able to be brave enough in your own life to be okay with what you want. And that's been hard for me because I might not want children. And that's, that's been a hard thing to experience as a woman, because that's kind of how we're defined. (laughs) Like, yeah. And that's kind of where a lot of our value comes from. And, um, people are very mean to a lot of women who say they don't want kids and I've seen it. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I haven't seen it so much in person, but online, online, online. Oh my. I mean, they're, they're, if you want to find some haters, talk about this topic and, uh, they'll all resurface. Yeah. But you said maybe you don't want, I, from what I've seen, it felt, well, I felt that you were quite strongly that you don't want to. Has that changed? I'm, 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 I like to be an open-minded person, right? Like, because I like to assume I don't really know anything on earth. I just really don't know anything. I can think I know something, but I never want to assume I'm right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm vegetarian since I'm 12 and I'm, I'm pretty sure, like, I don't think it's nice to kill animals and eat them. But I have a 5% part of my brain that's like, maybe someday I'll be like, you know what? F it. Like, I need it's that a bone circle marrow. of life. <laughs> yeah, it's a circle of life. Cry me a river. I'm killing all the cows. I'm killing everything. I don't care anymore. I'm going to go be a hunter. Who knows? I could change my mind. So I like to leave the door open. With kids, it could be maybe I'm having... I probably don't want kids because I didn't like my childhood, to be honest, right? And maybe I'll resolve it in time and be like, you know what? I'm going to be just the best, cutest, nicest mom. And I'm so ready. And maybe I won't resolve it in time. I'm 35. There's only really seven, eight years left, realistically. And also it's about like, I don't want to, at this point, have kids alone. And the chances of me finding a partner that I completely mesh with and I, me being the right partner... I'm like, I don't know if those chances are so high. So I'm open to it. I like to be open to it, but I like to lead with, I don't want kids because I've already been in two very long-term relationships where they want kids. And then, and you didn't, and I, with them, I did not because Mm -hmm. again, my, your, your partner is really important. And I want a partner that I feel like so supported by and like safe with Mm -hmm. and like, if I'm going to have kids with someone, that's important. Some people prioritize the kids, right? Some women or men are like, you know, I want the kid and the partner doesn't need to be perfect. I want the kid, right? And I'm so excited to be a parent and love something. And I'm the opposite. I'm like, I need the partner that I'm like obsessed with and they're obsessed with me. And then that creates a atmosphere where I can be my best self and then tiny chance have a kid. That makes perfect sense because like raising kids on your own, raising kids as a, like a couple is, excruciatingly difficult but to do that on your own I can't even fathom how that's possible I even say that it's inhumane for women to be solely responsible for their children because it's like that is that is too much of an expectation and it's actually morally wrong for one person to have all of that 24 7 I don't know how some people I don't know how it's even possible and how people do it and my mom was effectively a single mom since I was 11 yeah um because my father lived in another continent uh so i'm just like it's It's hard i don't know how yeah and i was already a child that can Mm -hmm. function alone right i was Mm -hmm. old enough that i can do things on my own but like it's crazy like even emotionally but i get you in terms of like finding the right partner i didn't want kids i I always knew i wanted kids at some point but i didn't have this life plan i'm like i'm gonna get married at you know, before 30 and have my kids and, you know, I'm going to have two kids, a boy and a girl. Like, I never really fantasized about that. And I didn't want kids with any of my partners before my husband. But when we met and it was just like this crazy, like, falling in love immediately, like, you're the love of my life. Like, we had kids immediately. 
So there was no See, that wedding. Would be, there that was would no, be a situation. So it's like in which you just I'd don't like, even whatever. like you don't even <laughs> think of, like it was. You don't even think about practicalities. It just is, and it happens. And um, what did you? Why did you? When you thought about wanting kids. Was it just natural that you just want, like, what is, like, what do you see as, like, the positive part of it? Like, why did you want, like, what are, yeah. what were you, like, excited about, you know? Like. I think that's a really difficult question. Like, what are you excited about? I wasn't, I've seen, my mom, my, I saw my mom raising my younger brother and sister, and I was kind of, like, almost like a, an extra parent because she got divorced, and, you know, that was really difficult, and seeing her you know, having to carry the responsibility, like a practical responsibility. And I think it put me off having kids actually for, for quite a long time. So I always knew I wanted them. I was like, well, not quite now, not, not yeah. right now. It's like, I knew what it would involve, like hands on, like what it's like. Um, but I also, because I have this sort of almost like a semi parent relationship with my brother and sister, I know the feeling and the joy of, you know, seeing somebody mm. grow up, and the relationship you have and just the love that you have for these human beings. Um, I just, I guess it was a sen also having like a sense of purpose, like feeling that your life isn't just for you, that it is for other, for others. I don't know. It's quite difficult to pin it down, but I think my brother and sister probably have quite a lot. And it's really funny because they're twins. So they're, and they're a boy and a girl. And, our kids are a girl and a boy, but they're not twins, but they're like so close in age. They're like yeah. 15 months apart. So it's almost like you're replicated. Like <laughs> you're, you're like, I've yeah. done this before. This is easy. Yeah. I didn't understand what life would be like after kids. So before it's like, you know, you, you're an okay looking woman, you know, you behave like a man, you know, you go into work or wherever and you basically live with all the privileges that you believe, you, you know, sexism doesn't, ex okay, maybe exist a little bit, but actually I'm not impacted. I can just yeah. be whatever I want. You know, my, my parents raised me. It's like, you can, you know, do, do whatever. And then having kids and you're like, wait a second, all of a sudden you don't have any of those privileges anymore. You know, how you are viewed as a person within a society completely shifts. And I did not, I don't know why, it's like it makes sense for that to have, you know, because we, we see it, but until you feel it and you in it, you just don't realize Was it more that the way people treat you is like less important, like less I give an you individual? an example. So because I have my own business, you know, I, I could travel anywhere. And when I had my, when we had our first child, I'm like, well, I can travel anywhere. Like I can just take my child with me. If my husband can travel with me, he can stay with her while I go to a business meeting or whatever. I take my pump or whatever. You yeah. know, I remember I was I went for this um, pitch in another European city. I won't say which one. <laughs> and, you know, the pitch went fine. And then there was going to be another one to go to yet another country. And then when that potential client found out that I'm traveling with my kids, they just retracted and said, actually, you know what? It's it's going to be too hard for you. So um, let's just park it. And I'm like, who are you to decide yeah. what's hard for me and what's not? You know, it's it's my business and I'm happy to do it and I can handle it. So why are you You're literally yeah. only saying no and rejecting it based on the fact that you believe that I can't do it because I have a child. And that was like, mm, I was, I don't think I was angry at that point. I was just like, yeah, whatever, you know, I've got bigger fish to fry and other things to do. But that really stayed with me. And the more I think about it, I was like, you know what, that was, that was just wrong. And that's my experience, let alone women who get laid off or, you know, face any kind of discrimination, don't get put up for promotions. So, I'm not surprised that there is this whole wave of women who are like, you know what? It's just not for me. Like, fuck this shit. Like yeah. I, you know, I have my own life. I have ambitions. I'm smart. I am a go-getter. You know what? That is more satisfying. That is more purposeful than having to raise kids and just be basically being like, whatever, you know, like not deal with you and make your life much harder so anyway that's my yeah. long <laughs> I agree I mean I I I think the difference between me and like some people is I know how not know because I've never experienced it but I am like 
I know how hard it is. Like when people say how hard it is, I'm listening. Like Mm -hmm. a lot of people are like, oh, I went into it and I was like, oh, it's not, it's going to be hard, but it'll be, and they're like, no, it's really hard. And I'm like, no, no, no. I paid attention. (laughs) I've been paying attention my whole life. Of course, I know there's so many upsides, but I think I've done a lot of research and talked to so many women and read so many forums about like having kids or not since I'm eight I didn't want kids like I had a very strong feeling Mm -hmm. um again like I said I am open but I'm like these these it's not like the right time like if I had a kid now I would be I want to have yeah I would want to meet someone like how you met your partner and then you're just like okay this is like I'm obsessed with you like let's do it right Mm -hmm. and so until something like that happens I will Mm. I will be here (laughs) <laughs> yes on do my you, own <laughs> do you think it's unfair that we have this biological clock that's ticking because there's only a certain window to have kids and wouldn't it be great if you can just put all of that on hold and like have kids when you're like 50 knowing that you've got another I don't know 50 60 years to go and you know then you've like reached all of your personal ambitions and potential then you can, and then you can have kids yeah for me, because I've never really wanted kids, I am like, I can't wait till I can't have kids. And then people <laughs> stop bothering me about it. And I'm like, ah, oh, the windows pass. And then they'll stop asking me questions, right? Mm. Like, so for me, I'm like, no, I would love to not be able to have kids even earlier. Like, get rid of my period and leave me alone, right? <laughs> um, but I think, I think there are so many advancements. I mean, naturally, I know a lot of women. My mom had me when she was almost 40, like, 39 almost 40 and my ex's uh, mom had her last kid naturally at 42 so with the advancements definitely women are going to be having kids like up to 50 I think for those women it's fine but really just like life is the way it is you know and I feel like there's so much we can do with the parameters we have Mm -hmm. and like I think there's just so many you know benefits to being a woman woman like in internal benefits like that sure yes men can have kids later but also you know most kids probably don't want older parents like that much older if they can choose it's easier to connect with a younger parent and you'll have more time with them and um so for me I'm like no but (laughs) for other people it would be great that they could have an extra 10 years and not stress about it Um, But there is something, you know, to life. Limits make you perform, right? Limits make you do more with the time you have. That's why moms are famous for being so, like, able to do so many things at the same time because they have time constraints. They have the kids, they have this, and they want to do other things with their careers. I love hiring moms. I want to reverse discrimination hire moms. Like, I know we're not supposed to ask, but in job interviews, I tell my HR people, I'm like, if they're a mom, like, it's extra good. Mm -hmm. Because moms work really hard, and moms are organized, and moms are motivated. I don't think there's any issue with, like, interruptions. If there's issues with interruptions, that's that person's personality. It's not because they're a mom. They'll find anything to make it Mm -hmm. uh, an interruption. My plant is dying. I need to take care of it, you know? So, you know, I'm not a mom. And if I was employed, I'd make excuses. I'm the worst employee ever. I'd be like, oh my God, I'm, look, even today I was like, can we rearrange the podcast? I can't come at the exact time I said, you know, Mm. so. But what you said about constraints, I think that is really key because we can't, we can't have it all. You have to make a choice. And a lot of women don't have that choice, actually. Yeah. And I think it is a very empowering to say, you know what? that's not for me. I want this. And given your background of kind of going with what everybody else wants rather than focusing on what you want, that's almost extra important to you to be able to be like, you know what? No, you know, I've done that bit. (laughs) did what you want. (laughs) Of of doing what other people expect of me. Like this is my moment. This is my time to do what I want. So going back to, so going back to the divorce because that was like a pivotal moment for you and then like having that sip of first sip of coffee and having that first sip of alcohol like talk me through what happened then I mean it was I think the most interesting part to me was how slowly I did it because I think a lot of people when they leave a certain upbringing they kind of go crazy Mm -hmm. like you've heard about 
Amish Rumstein or Rumspring, whatever it's called, the Amish leave for a year and they go crazy. Um, and for me, it was very, very slow and like a method test, 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 test. And I think when I, you know, there's no point in having regrets in life, but I kind of am very sad that I was not able to do this earlier because I'm so much happier now. And like things that people said are so bad. I mean, this is going to be controversial, but even alcohol, like everybody loves to hate on alcohol. But for me, Ray's so conservative and tight and so in control and I'm not able to let go. Like, because I was never tempted. I never broke any rules like my entire life. Alcohol is like, listen, I'm not going to be an alcoholic and drink all the time forever, but it's, it's a tool that for me helps me relax a bit. And like, everyone's like, oh, I can do it without alcohol. Well, I can't. Okay. (laughs) So I like once in a while to have a drink or two. And I feel so much more relaxed and myself because I don't have this. I was raised with this judgmental, constant narrative. Don't do this. Don't do that. This is bad. This is good. Everything's black and white. Everything's right and wrong. Uh, this is, you're a good person. You're a bad person. It's like exhausting. And like, I don't, I probably shouldn't talk about drugs, but you know, there are plant medicine things that are like so incredible and just have been demonized by society. And, you know, there's a reason that there's these like ancient practices with literal plants that are unedited. Like a mushroom is a mushroom. It's not a chemical. Right. And I just, am like, man, my life would have been so much nicer if I had had kind of these freedoms when I was young. And I know some people love religion. It's not against religion. Some people are happy in religion, but I was not. Like I look back at my whole life and I was I was like a muted version of myself. Mm. And now I feel like in the past year, really only, I've been able to be like me and more unapologetically me. And I can set boundaries where I want and I can be like, this is what I want. And if that doesn't, if you don't like that about me, like, that's okay. Like Mm -hmm. you can do what you want and I can do what I want. And you do you great. Like (laughs) amazing. You know, Mm -hmm. like live your life. I'm so happy for you. I'm going to live my life. It's very freeing. I see why people will say your forties are nice. Cause they're like, you stop caring in your forties what people think. And I'm like, yes, I've certainly not there yet. (laughs) (laughs) Do you think that having had this very restrictive way of living, very early just makes you appreciate being able to be this free now more that's a good point maybe I do like we were talking before the podcast how you guys growing up saw movies of the U.S. and you're like oh my god a locker and then a cafeteria and to me I'm like "Ugh, a locker a cafeteria but now even in retrospect I'm like you know what that is cool it is cool to have a locker and to be like at an American high school and I think you're right I think I really appreciate these things now and a lot of people at my age, I just turned 35, like a lot of them are stopping drinking and they're stopping all of this because they did it too much, right? It's, there is a matter of excess. They've been doing it for 16 years. But for me, I'm like, wow, it's so amazing. Like I can have a cocktail. Like this is so cool. Like, um, I mean, I don't drink coffee because it makes me anxious, but like Mm -hmm. in theory, if I liked coffee, I could be like, oh, this is amazing. Like I got a little bit of energy as Mm -hmm. long as of course you're not addicted and things like that. And like, even like, um, like dating, like being able to think about relationships as like having an emotional connection with someone. I think because I was so focused on like, don't have sex, don't do anything sexual. I was like this all the time with relationships, like, ah, like hands up. And it stopped me from like getting close to people emotionally. If it, it, I was so focused on not being sexual that I forgot to focus on connecting emotionally. Mm. Like it was more of like this game. Relationships were more like a board game than a, a visceral experience. Mm-hmm. And so that's something I'm working on this it's year. It's like overthinking everything. Yeah, overthinking instead of just like connecting with someone and like being open and like that's like what kind of life is about. And I was so on the defense that I didn't have those opportunities. And I've luckily like met some people in the last year that have kind of opened my eyes to that. And I'm still on that journey for sure. Mm. Um, But it's like, oh, this is what life is about. Like, Mm. it's not just about work and money and status. And it's like about connecting with people. Mm. Yeah. On the topic of sex, yeah, I saw in one of 
videos when I was doing some research yes. talking about <laughs> that you didn't have sex with your husband yeah. for the first three years. The whole marriage. We never, I've never so had the, sex so with my husband. So this is your first, this is your first <laughs> marriage. My first marriage. So I was only married once. My second relationship Sorry, feels I'm, like yeah. a marriage because it, everyone calls it, don't worry, everyone, it was seven years. So it's, it's, it's a marriage. a marriage. Yeah. yeah, but legally not. Um, so my marriage was when I was 22, 25 in my religion for three years. Yeah. Um, we never had sex, uh, because I was so like in, I was so in my head. I think it's hard for people to see me as that person because how people see me now, but my body just like, I was so anxious on my wedding night and I was so dreading it. And I was just like, like just so like stressed and my body just was shut. Like I'd never used a tampon. Nothing had ever like gone inside even like medically. Mm -hmm. So when it was time, like I couldn't relax. My body was so tense. And now I know the name for it. At the time I didn't know when I went to all these doctors and they're like, you're fine. And I was like, obviously I'm not <laughs> like, mm -hmm. obviously I'm not fine. Uh, and it was really, a, I mean, I'm the, I don't like the medical system. I feel like most of the medical system is even now I have issues with other things and the doctors I'm spending thousands of pounds and they're like, Oh, it's in your head. And I'm like, thank you. Love that. It's like, what is it? It's like 70% of studies on women's issues are done on men. Yes. Like, well, yeah. well, duh. <laughs> and I'm like, great. I'm so glad I came to a female gynecologist specialist in London paid the most money anyone has ever spent on one appointment. And then you're like, Oh, it's, it's not, it's nothing. And I'm like, Thanks so much. That was great. So I'm having the same experience 15 years later as I did when I got married. The doctors were like female doctors as well. We're like, oh, you're imagining it. Um, it's in your head, which it was in my head to be fair. But then they would say, uh, we'll just open you up with diaphragms. So the, they were showing me these like metal prongs. That's the sexiest thing ever, right? That's what's going to get you to open up. Metal, cold metal prongs. They're like, take these cold metal prongs home and every night just stick one inside and just open it a little more. And, and this was a solution. This three different doctors told me to pry my body open with metal prongs more and more every night. And I just, even at that age, like even as like naive as I was, I was like, this is not, this is not the solution. It like, makes me feel very ill. It That's was, horrendous. Yeah. That's what they said diaphragms they're called diaphragms they're like just push yourself open and I was like I'm definitely not doing that so luckily I ignored that that doesn't seem like the thing I'd like to do <laughs> no! for fun <laughs> even if you're like even if you are a sexual person that would shut you right up I think even if you are naturally open and you were able to have sex I, I think give up sticking sex metal now. prongs in would be like oh we're closed we're closed for business mm -hmm. so yeah we could never have sex he was very nice about it I need to give him so much credits three years um I just couldn't and I thought I was, I thought I was fucked for life. I was not fucked essentially for life. I was like, I just, I'm some, I'm just, something is wrong with me. And I was like, I'm never going to have sex. Like I'm just, and I didn't even want to have sex. I was so anti-sex from being religious. Like not everyone internalizes religion that way. I'm not blaming the religion, but I just was like, I never like fantasized about having sex. Like I would have fantasized about making out or, but like actual sex was terrifying to me. And anyways, after the divorce, I was like, I had like a little suspicion in the back of my head. I had like a little like glimmer of hope. And I was like, there's a tiny, tiny part of my brain that thinks if my partner doesn't know I was religious and doesn't know I had this trauma, it might work. Cause I think there's a part of me that's like, Oh, you know, I'm religious. It's impure for me to have sex. You know, I'm a virgin. You're like excited. You get to have a virgin and I feel objectified. I just, I had this idea. So a year after my divorce, I got divorced in August, a year, a little more than a year, a year and a few months, I was traveling and I met someone and he was like very nice and like very like besotted with me and I had no makeup on when he met me and my hair was curly and insane and I looked absolutely insane and I was like oh this guy likes me like in my worst version of myself and he was in like, your view in my view in my view now I look back and I was like oh I was pretty <laughs> um it's like this tall handsome German man and I was like ah and he like followed me around Sri Lanka I'd booked my flight wrong I was supposed to arrive a week later with my best friend from high school and I am unorganized. And so I booked the wrong date. I landed in Sri Lanka alone. Uh, I was like, where am I? This chaotic airport. I'm towering above everyone because I'm tall. This woman comes up to me at the station 
at the airport station, whatever. And she's like, um, I need your help. And I was like, Oh God, what's happening? Am I, am I going to be, am I going to be stolen? Um, and she's like, my boyfriend and I are from different castes, like, uh, whatever. I mean, not related, but castes, whatever. And, uh, so we want to go on vacation, but my father won't let us because we're from different castes and he's a Tamil and I'm a something else. And can you, he's going to pick you up in a truck. A man's going to, I swear to God, I'm not, she's like, a man's going to pick you up in a truck. My boyfriend, he's a man. He's going to pick you up in a truck and just get in the truck. I can't get in with you because my dad can't see us together. I'm sitting at this, I'm sitting at this airport and I'm, I'm, I'm 26. I'm divorced. I'm like, what do I have to live for? I swear to God. I was like, who cares if I die? I don't know where the hell I am or where I'm going. I booked my flight on the wrong day. I don't know where to go in this country. And I go, fine. So I'm like, show me your, show. she's like, I'm a flight attendant. And I was like, show me your ID. She shows me an ID. I take a picture. I'm like, at least if I die on iCloud, they can trace my murderer. <laughs> and so I get a in this truck. Very peaceful thought at the time. <laughs> peaceful thought. I get in this truck with a random Sri Lankan man. I'm like, oh, well, like, let's see what happens. He drives me through the airport. Another man comes in, like, win in the window, which is maybe her father, I'm guessing, if this was all true. Like, looks around, is like, are you a tourist? And I'm like, yes, I'm a tourist. And he's taking me on a tour. And I was like, what if this is the police trying to save me from being trafficked? I'm lying to their face. We leave the airport. We pick up the girl. It was all true. I was not trafficked. She was so grateful that I did it so that she could go on this vacation with her boyfriend that she took her, like, necklace off her neck and, like, gave it to me. Aww. They drove me to this room remote town and that's where I met the German it just was very kismet and I went to this random hostel and that night I went up to go pee and I was sick and I went to go pee and I was like I hope no one sees me I look like I was hit by a truck and I've been traveling all day and I come You've back and I truck. see this beautiful man in the hallway and I was like god no why do you see me now and that's the person that I ended up um and he didn't know I didn't tell him anything about me I just was very vague I was like I hope he thinks I'm just an American girl sleeping my way around the world and I sleep with many men and I want him to think that so that he treats me normally and um yeah after a few weeks we like slept together and it, I did cry and but I hid that I was crying from him and it was painful but it was possible and I was like oh my god it's possible like mm -hmm. I'm able to relax he doesn't know and now I'm not normal because I have all these mental hang-ups around physicality but I'm working so hard on being you know there is no normal all women I think have some kind of like things we've been told around sexuality and there's lots of shame about around it um but i'm getting so much better and um like really like in a place where i feel and you good. were in control you yeah. you were you know it was your decision of how to handle it and how to be and you kind of selected the mate selected. and <laughs> like you <laughs> yeah but also how you wanted it to be and i think there is something to that too yeah, and I think also, like, in German culture and Dutch culture, there's, like, much less shame around sexuality and stuff. And so I think just knowing, like, it's a guy from that culture where if you sleep with them, they don't just see you as, like, uh, like, oh, she slept with me, she's less than, or she slept with me, mm -hmm. she's used. Like, it's crazy, like, how many people still think that way. Really, 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 really a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and even, like, educated people, like, they have these subconscious kind of things like even myself I'll catch myself thinking that of other people and I'm like no 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 let's pull it back mm -hmm. so it's about retraining myself and like not allowing other people's mm. um kind of biases to affect me. What kind me. of messages were you taught or discussed with I mean early on did your mom talk to you about it and how was that delivered to you? It was very much like a an 100% abstinence culture. So at my university, uh, you sign something called the honor code. Every semester you sign the honor code. And the honor code is essentially like, I'm going to adhere to this religion. I will not drink coffee. I will not drink alcohol. I will not lie. That's a good one. Don't lie. Um, I will not. So at my university, you have, you men cannot even be in your apartment past midnight. Like you can, if you're having a movie night and it's midnight, bye-bye. Like, and people will report you. It's like 1984. They'll be like, hey, this this person had someone over past midnight or this. Not everyone will, but a lot of people will. Um, the sex you place. cannot go into the sex place. You cannot go into the opposite gender's bedroom at any point. Like if you're studying, you can't go in the bedroom. You Even if you're just kissing, you can't go in the bedroom. And if they find out, you have to go to the honor code office. It's really scary. And I've had, I had to go there once and it's terrifying. And they can expel you and they can take your degree away. So like at a normal university... You can sleep with 10 people a day and your education is not affected. 
at my university, your morality can affect your entire future and education. So it's very terrifying. So like, for example, um, the messages we received are like, you should not do anything that arouses sexual feelings. So you can kiss, but they would say like, have a chaste kiss. So like, and if you get turned on, you're supposed to stop. Like mm. that's the messaging I received. And um, Which 100%. teaches you to suppress your own emotions and the things that come up in you. Oh, so suppressed. Mm -hmm. So suppressed. Now, I was like rebellious. <laughs> when I tell people, they're like, I'm embarrassed for you. That's not rebellious. But at my university, it was rebellious. Like, I hate sleeping alone. <laughs> like, I like having a guy next to me uh, or a girlfriend even. Like, you know, if I have a close friend and they're nearby. But so for me, like, I would want to have sleepovers with my boyfriends. And I wasn't having sex with them. And I wasn't doing bad things. I just wanted to sleep and cuddle. Mm -hmm. And so I would do that. But it was, like, very sketchy. It was, like, I am a bad naughty girl who's, like, having sleepovers with boys. And, like, that was considered bad. Like, <sighs> it was just, it was a lot. Like, mm -hmm. you self-report as well. So, like, one time with a boyfriend of one year, we slipped up and did something sexual that most people do in high school. Um, and I self-reported. Like, I went to the bishop, and I was like, hey, I did this with my longtime boyfriend. And he's like, you need to tell me exactly what you did. I had to, like, describe it. It's embarrassing. It's shameful. It's, like, horrible. And now I look at it, and I'm like, this is terrible. How is, this, how is a 20-year-old woman telling a 50-year-old man her what she did sexually, like, with her boyfriend in private so that he can judge her and tell her if she's expelled or not. And, I mean... Honestly, like, listening to your story and having to grow up like that, and, like, my mom was religious, but she never really enforced it on me. And even in Russia, you kind of were not religious because religion wasn't allowed, mm. but then there was communism <laughs> instead. And then when that collapsed then people were more openly religious. And that was, in some ways, that was also quite empowering because people chose to do it. Yeah. So my mom never really enforced it. But there are certain elements of, that just haven't kind of caught up with the modern life, especially the sort of female, male divide, body How agency. How do you feel in, in Russia the messaging was about sexuality or things like that or relationships? Well, when I was, I think I was like 10 or 11, and my mom gave me a book about sex and procreation. And it wasn't just procreation. I, th I mean, it kind of mostly was, but it did sort of talk about some of the other aspects. And it was a book for kids. And I was like, wow, my mom is so progressive that she's given it to me. She didn't talk to me about it because that was a step too far. But she did give me she's something like <laughs> educational. And whilst we never discussed sex and I don't remember sex education in school but I left Russia when I was 12 so maybe that was yeah too early even by kind of western standards then so I never had any hang-ups about that um huh. I, I really don't think I did and so you weren't worried like oh if I sleep with someone they'll judge me or if I sleep with too many people people will judge me or I mean I would read like all those teenage magazines when we were here like 17 yeah. or whatever I can't even remember what they were called which talked about you know how it feels if when you lose your virginity or you know things to be aware of when you're kind of thinking about that so I got my education from essentially like books and yeah. magazines and that was very reassuring because it talked about it openly it talked about it with your kind of it, it was empowering and oh, yeah I wasn't so, supposed to read those magazines they were like seen as like that's so interesting because even in my head now I think oh those magazines were like trash magazines yeah. and you're like oh, I mean there were a lot of trash in there too <laughs> and I'm like oh my god yeah. but I've never received <laughs> negative messages about sex but I don't wow. think that's necessary I don't know somehow I managed to avoid that and I know some of my peers didn't I mean in school you're kind of oh you know that girl kissed so and so and now she's a slut <laughs> and you know she's had three boyfriends so you know she's you know the 
scarlet woman or a yeah. devil woman or whatever so you, you did receive those messages and i think what was most damaging was the lads magazines because mm. it wasn't really what you were kind of consuming it was what the opposite sex was consuming yeah. because the messaging there i think was really damaging for women's perception of what made them valuable so this kind of like hypersexuality and for men it was seeing women as as objects as they still are yeah so we still haven't really moved far enough in the right direction about that so I was aware of that but being able to be more in control and be more like I I have autonomy and agency and I can be selective and it's my decision rather than someone else's so I've I don't know I just I had that yeah but That's I think amazing. it was more hypersexuality that was, it's almost like the opposite problem, ah. which I think is not good for young girls either. Of being yeah. like, oh, you know, just go and have sex with whoever I want. And, you know, I, I think this kind of like throwaway culture of, of that, I don't think that's helpful to women either because, and this is really great book, uh, I think it's called The Sexual Revolution. Um, which I read and it made me look at sexuality in a very different way about how actually biologically a lot of women, not necessarily don't, don't, okay, I'm trying to remember exactly kind of how she said it was the, the intimacy and the connection is more important for majority of women rather than this sort of like sexual act itself. And then you just sort of move on and, and that's fine. For most women, that's not really how their sexuality is designed and what makes them, you know, receive pleasure and and actually be happy about it. And that a lot of women now kind of going along with this sort of Ledet culture of, well, that's what's expected of me. And if I'm in the dating pool, then I'm not going to be as desirable or have as many options for a partner if I'm not like that. So they almost become this way and mm. it benefits men more than it benefits women because it's like, well, if all these 10 girls are willing to sleep with me without a commitment, great for me. Whereas actually maybe those 10 girls out of, you know, out of this 10, maybe seven of them actually do want a relationship. And that's yeah. what actually they're there for. They're hoping but if they happen. don't have sex, they don't have as many options yeah, or not seen as desirable by someone. So it made me look at that in a different way. So I don't think either ways are right. Yeah. It's like complete extremes, but... Like, how do we, like, what can we learn from, you know, abstaining, from, you know, having good morals, but at the same time, not shaming and seeing, you know, sexual act as something that's natural and understanding it more rather than yeah. being like, you know what, we don't understand it. Let's just push it away and just not talk about it or not do it or make other people feel bad. That's, you know, that's something, something wrong with it. So I think need to learn from both sides that's just my view yeah and I think something that's been helpful in general with sexuality or just like life and like progress and everything is just like self-compassion and just this reminder when you do start to be like oh I shouldn't have done that or I shouldn't have done that career thing or I shouldn't have gone on a date with that person or whatever like just being like you know what like it's okay like how would you talk to like your kid if they made a mistake you'd be like oh my god everyone makes mistakes like that's how you learn like okay so what did we learn from this okay let's say it's like a, a dating thing since we're talking about dating oh you you did something with this person they don't want a relationship with you now you feel sad okay like did you express your feelings to them like what did you hope would happen like okay maybe next time we can delay doing something a little longer and make sure maybe we can express our needs and like also knowing not everything's going to be perfect like no one can figure out everything perfectly like I'm sure when you met your partner like it's not like you could have forced one of these other men to be your partner by acting correctly it's just they weren't the right person right yeah. so I think like being self-compassionate is so key and like so like the best feeling ever like anything you mess up you're just like oh, I'm just gonna be nice to myself like, I've been thinking about this idea of self-compassion because it's something that comes up for me time and time again and also I read a lot in terms of you know mental health and how to even be like more productive and more successful and the self-compassion to me is the first step towards emotional intelligence. If you can be self-compassionate to yourself, then it's a lot easier to be compassionate for other people. 
And I think a lot of our problems actually go away. Like the anxiety, the, the shame is when we feel like, you know what? It is what it is. Like it's happened. Yes, I made this mistake, but you know, I'm still a good person inside. And I think I see a lot within at least the religions that I've experienced, this idea of like what well, with Christianity, this sort of like the what is like the what is it called? The sin um the original sin or oh, it's like you're born sinful yeah. and so your whole life you go through your life, you know, repenting. Yeah. And I kind of fundamentally don't I can't accept that because yeah. I don't think we're all born bad. I think we are all born in different ways, actually. There's lots of similarities. And we are just thinking of yourself as a bad, shameful person creates a lot more problems, both for the individual and for, for society. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So this idea of, of returning to self-compassion is fundamental in our ability to exist in a very in a positive way that we can actually embrace who we are and when we embrace who we are we can contribute so much more and i think there is it's it's under it's an underrated technique yes <laughs> if yeah. you want to put it that way yeah like that how like nice would it have been to be taught that in school you know like starting the day with like self-compassion like okay everyone just take like 10 seconds and be like oh are you like are you anxious or anything are you like worried about anything like that's okay like you know just like these calming techniques are I, I'm sure schools these days are I'm not sure but I'm hoping they're kind of integrating it more as it's becoming more popular my high school did try a little bit like I had like a yoga therapy program I was in in mm. high school which was so amazing and I just feel like you know, in addition to, you know, discovering and liking alcohol, uh, also when I was younger, like I wish I'd learned meditation mm -hmm. and people say prayer is meditation, but it can be, but it isn't immediately. If you're not doing prayer in a meditative way, it's not meditation. Right. But it can be meditation is like amazing. Like that's what mm -hmm. we should do in school. Like that's what kids should be introduced to and practice since they're young. And I just think everyone would be so much happier and I remember and even like two years ago, if anyone talked about meditation, I was like, shut up, please. Like, ugh, I don't want to meditate. I want to sit in a chair. I'd rather die. That sounds like the worst thing ever. And now I'm like, okay, fine. I think <laughs> anything that has sort of triggering effect, the word kind of goes in and out of fashion. I also have like, oh, meditation. It's, I actually don't have a problem with the word meditation. But when I speak to other people about it, now I've started to reframe it and call it or rename it even, a meeting with myself. Ooh. So it's like I go and meet who the real me is yeah. without all of this like chitter chatter. That's such a good framing. And so it's like, it's kind of almost like a business day. Like I'm having a meeting with myself, but it just like my real self, not yeah. just like all these, you know, faces that I put on with different people. Because let's face it, we all do that. Like we, we would love to be as authentic and as open as possible. But human nature is such that we do put on those faces. And actually, I want to talk about that from a perspective of like social and content creation, because we haven't even touched on any oh, yeah. of that. Yeah, I'm talking about content creation. <laughs> um, <laughs> because there is something about and with my personal experience of, you know, being you know, I don't have a huge following on social media, but I am beginning to study it and understand it a lot more. And like, how can you like my my view is how can I be more? of myself but in a digital form but that also means that I have to actually learn who I am <laughs> as a person because in my regular day-to-day -day life I haven't really given it much thought but having to think about that in terms of like how do you present yourself digitally it forced me to actually go deeper into like well who am I like what do I stand for like what and who who do I want to become and like where am I going with this um, so I don't know if you've had that experience or like what's your been your experience of like content from like how you started to where you are now. I think something that I've received a lot of feedback on online and I never really did intentionally, <clears throat> but I think for, for whatever reason, like I land online as authentic. So I get a lot of feedback, authentic, authentic. And that's not like, I didn't sit down and go, my brand is authenticity. Like, no, I had no idea. I just am that way. And I think you don't necessarily have to think about who you are. You are, you are, you. 
And then when you show up online, people are going to reflect you what you are, right? Mm. So it's I, interesting on that yeah. point. It's like, <laughs> I know me is like, I need to think it through. So that's like my way. It's like, I'm not just a, an immediately open person. Like I need to like think it, that's just that's how I am. And you don't have, you know what? There's, I have a girlfriend, um, Erica. She's like a very successful social media TikTok lawyer. Um, yeah. So Erica, uh, she does the Erica taught me. I love her. Things. Yeah, she's amazing. She is amazing. And Erica, for example, is someone who, yes, recently she shared a, a little more of her personal life. Yeah. But when she grew her page, it was nothing personal. Like, she doesn't show her partner. She doesn't show her personal life. And I think it shows, like, there's so many ways to show up online. And that's still Erica being authentic. Mm -hmm. She just is being authentic with her money knowledge and helping people and she doesn't want people to get cheated and she wants to help people save money. And that is what she wants to share online. So just because I, as a lean, am authentic in that I'm like, I'll tell everyone on the internet everything about my sex life, about my money. I'm like, I'm so not private. I'm just like, I will tell you 98% of everything in my life. Maybe 2% I'll keep private. Mm -hmm. And someone like Erica is like, I will tell you 2%. <laughs> like, yeah. you will know my work life she did just share about IVF but normally she doesn't share her personal stuff yeah no it was it was actually a really interesting story and I followed her before because she she has a podcast which is excellent and yeah. also the um, the whole Erica taught me her great podcast the, yeah well the um, the the clips of kind of like the TikTok clips that she does about well you know going to get a discount at Nike or oh, like yeah. reclaiming which is great and so I was quite surprised that she started being much more open and the IVF going into a clinic and going through this procedure with no, I was like, I remember she was saying, shall I just do it without anesthesia? And I was like, no, <laughs> don't go. And then she did. <laughs> and then she did because I once tried to have a, a, co a you know, the coil, which is the. Yes. Yes. How do I describe it? Um, the contraceptive. IUD. Yeah. IUD, exactly. And I remember I was going and it's like, well, just take some ibuprofen before you go. And I remember I was just lying there and I just went like completely pale. Like I was just like so distressed and I was like in pain and I felt like I was just being like violated. I said, how much further to go? And it's like, well, you're about like two millimeters in. And I was like, stop like I can't do this like and I, I had to take a day off of work I didn't say what was happening yeah and I just went home and I went to bed and I cried and I went to sleep and I was like it was the most traumatic experience and I'm like how can you do this to a woman and I think it's okay I mean and, I think and this is also something that needs to be like a big focus in the next 10 20 years of everyone is like the medical system and the way it treats especially women like I think that's something that really needs to change mm. yeah so yeah so when she was going through that I was like oh my god that's um and that's part of her version of being authentic is that what mm. she really cares about specifically is like helping people not ha make the same mistakes or go through things she's gone through mm -hmm. and originally she did that in terms of money because that's where she knows and you know she'd been in debt for university and paid it off and all this so now I think it's translating to that's why she shared. Mm -hmm. She's not sharing for attention. She's not sharing this personal event for any reason other than she doesn't want other people to like feel alone and she wants other people to feel, you know, that way. And for you and you're kind of discovering your brand, I mean, it's, it's a process. And I think like, I was so stressed about it. Like I was a content creator. My whole personality was like, hi, my name is lean. Welcome. Like that was my whole personality online. And I, that's not me now. Like I'm not that now. I'm not going to wear bright colors. I'm not going to wear a unicorn hat. That was me. It was real. I was like young and fun. And now I'm a little more serious. And so rebranding is kind of part of what I've been doing lately. And just, you know, you're going to, you're going to lose people in the rebrand. And I lost so many people, like hundreds of thousands of people. And I think, um, it's hard, but like, it's such a cliche, but like the hard things make you stronger. Like think about really famous politicians. Not that I like politicians, but like people hate them. Like, and they just keep going and they just keep going on camera. It's like, how can they do that? Like, I literally hate you. I literally want to kill you. I want mm. to assassinate you. And they're just like, hey, hello everyone. Today we're talking about my next, you know, it's like a resilience. You're building this resilience. Um, so I think for you just being like, again, self-compassion, like, oh, I'm curious. Like, what do I like? Like what lands well? Like asking your, what do your friends ask you about? And also just making content about what you want to and in the way you want to. Um, 
and seeing how people react. Like I never thought I cared about women's rights. I never in my brain was like, I care about women, never. But then when I made videos, people were like, oh, you're the women's rights woman. And I was like, oh, I didn't even realize a lot of my videos are about women's rights. It was not conscious. It's just what I was like, oh, this pisses me off. I'm making a video about this. And it was like, if I was still making videos, I'd do one about women's health system. But I'm retired now. I've moved on. <laughs> so yeah. Someone else can take the baton and make those videos. So what is the shift now? So you're talking about like reinvention, redesign, you know, shifting. Like what's happening with I think you? before <laughs> I was doing output, I was like, you know, in your 20s, you want to save the world. So I was like, I'm going to save the world. I'm going to make these videos about being vegetarian and then eating less meat and uh, helping people with passport disparity and visa issues. And because I always felt for some reason, I feel very connected to people who don't get to live, like don't have access to the life they want. Even though I grew up as a white woman in America with the best passport ever, I somehow really connect to people where I'm like, you don't get to like you're trapped essentially, right? Either by a visa or by a law or by being a woman where you don't get to do things you want. But it's very draining. Like being a social justice warrior drained me. And the more you care about social rights and human rights, the more people are hard on you, right? It's like the people who are harshest on vegans are other vegans, right? They're like, oh, well, that's not mm -hmm. vegan. And oh, well, that's not perfect. And that's how it felt. I was like, I felt badgered constantly by people that are like, oh my God, why didn't you talk about this issue? And Did you also feel like it was like a heavy thing for you, even when you were not reading like comments? It's heavy. It's heavy to make content about heavy topics and researching. I mean, I had a video about female genital mutilation, like mm -hmm. interviewing women who have gone through it, interviewing lawyers and people it's exhausting and I was like you know what I did five years of this I'm still gonna help the world but I'm not gonna do it in such a direct clear way mm -hmm. um I did I did my output I'm gonna do input I'm gonna now make my life good I'm gonna make myself happy and I'm gonna care about me and I'm gonna care about being happy and learning how to be happy because mm -hmm. I was so anxious I was never happy like I would hear people be like, yeah, I'm so happy. And I was like, are you, is everyone lying? Like, is everyone just saying that? Is that just like a saying? Like, oh, I'm so, I genuinely was like never happy. And now like for the first time in my life, like I could say consistently I'm happy. It's crazy. I get it now. And like spending the last year working on decreasing my anxiety and learning that it's possible because I was like, oh, I'm just going to be anxious forever. It's just my natural state. I'm just going to be constantly anxious and overthinking. And then you need to tell me your secrets. Oh, I will. I'll say, I'll give you a summary of one year of intensive therapy and retreats. Okay. Number one is have a mantra. So my mantra, I have three, but the main one is everything I do is the right thing or every decision I make is the right decision. Every place I am is the right place. So for example, if today I had this podcast and I had another thing at the same time in the past, I'd spend hours suffering being like oh my god which one should i go to should i go to this it'll affect the rest of my life the butterfly effect if i go here i might meet this no now i'm just like you know what i'll think about it one minute two minutes set a time limit i'm going to this podcast and because i'm at the podcast that's the best place in the world for me to be because every decision i make is the right decision and really you start to believe it and now you feel very powerful. I'm like, if I cross the street, that is the best. I just made the best decision. And whatever happens because <laughs> it's of liberating. that. Liberating. Oh, so liberating. You mm. never have FOMO anymore. I like, you're like, oh my God, I got invited to this yacht. Should I go to that yacht? But really, I just feel like being in my bed today. And I'm like, I'm going to be in my bed. And you know who's missing out? The people on the yacht are missing out because I'm not on the yacht. Like my bed is the best place to be because I'm here. And it, it's very empowering. It doesn't mean I'll never socialize. Of course, a lot of times I want to go to things. Mm. I saw that video that you did on Jomo. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. The joy of missing out instead yeah. of, because I, my friends were like, you have crazy FOMO in the past. So I was like, oh my God, I need to work on this. And I used to spread myself thin and I was exhausted. And I was like going to every social event. And I had this like limit mindset, like oh, I'm not going to get to this again. Like living in London, I'm like, oh my God, I need to go to every members club, every event, every party. I'm living in London for the first time. What if I never live in London again? And I'm, I've slowed down now. Mm. And just so the number one thing, if you have a lot of anxiety, have a mantra. It can, you can steal mine. Everyone has different things they stress about. But for me, like everything I do is the right thing. Every place I am is the right place. Because most of my decisions are about should I go X 
here or there because I'm a digital nomad. I work for myself. I travel full time. And so I would be like, should I go to Cape Town? Should I go to London? And now I'm like, I would go like, oh my God, there's this event. I should stay in London to go to that event. There's going to be cool people on I'm like, no, no, no. I am the cool people. I am the cool people. Wherever I go is the best place. I bring the party. <laughs> I am the party. I am the best. I am the best company mm-hmm. for myself, you know? And it's helped so much. And it makes you more attractive and magnetic because people are like, wow, she knows what she wants. She knows where she is. I literally say to people, when I moved to London, I did an Instagram story and I was like, I am not leaving Islington. I'm not leaving Islington. I'm not traveling across the city to hang out with anyone. If you want to hang out with me, you can find me here in Islington. And look, now I found you. You guys are six minute walk from my house. (laughs) I didn't even know. Like I just... Everything just mm-hmm. like builds around. You become the epicenter of your life instead of making all these other people and events the epicenters. It's so relaxing. So one is having a mantra. Two is learning very basic meditation. The most simple for people at home, like my mom was like, how do I meditate? I need to send her a voice note and tell her how. There's two simple ways. One is just slowing down and like being aware of where you are. So like right now we can talk and essentially be meditating and be like oh I'm looking at you you're here you have brown hair you have blue eyes like this microphone is here like this I am here nothing exists outside of me and you in this room like this is like meditation is slowing down and then another way to do it is the way many people learn like at home just be quiet and just sit I put on a timer for one minute and even that was like hell for me at first mm-hmm. it's like a minute what am I gonna do for a minute and then you just go you just look at your thoughts. This is how someone taught me. She's like, close your eyes. You're like, oh, I'm thinking about that there's a camera watching me. And then you don't judge the thought. You just look at it and you're like, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to release that thought. And you try to get to no thoughts, but you don't judge that you have no thoughts. Just when you see a thought, when your thought's like, oh my God, I need to text my dad. Happy birthday. You'd be like, I don't need to do that at this minute. I'm releasing the thought. That's inter- Oh, that's interesting that I had that thought. Like non-judgmental, the self-compassion thing. I think if you have a mantra... And you learn how to slow down. And when you, when I feel anxious, if I'm on the tube and I feel anxious, I go, I'm on the tube. Like, this is so cool. Like, yes, it's very loud. It's screeching and it's very hot. But it's like, wow, there's like a machine that's like transporting me underground to my next location. How cool is this? Mm-hmm. And like, just listening to sounds is meditation. Or like, there's something called walking meditation where, you know, I walked here. So sometimes I just, during the day, if I'm walking, I'm like, oh, I'm going to slow down I'm walking fast why am I walking fast Mm -hmm. if I'm there 30 seconds later everyone's gonna panic and I'm now creating a stress response for a six minute walk when I could just walk slowly and get there 30 seconds later right Mm -hmm. you just slow down everything in your life because we're rushed we're constantly rushed and slowing down I think just makes your nervous system like does this need to be rushed no no like if really I do fast. this 30 seconds faster, like who wins? Wow, incredible. <laughs> now my height. A my minute, goal. even like a day. I mean, it's like, <laughs> unless it's like some sort of like, you know, sur- surgery somewhere. Okay, maybe, but yeah. most things can wait. Most things can wait. Yeah. yeah. Um, just tying in with what you were saying before in terms of having these very heavy social causes, discussing them and, you know, kind of almost entering that I would almost say sort of like the anger state because, you know, you're, if you're campaigning for it, you're talking about it, you know, you become, I was like, you know, it's just not fair. It's not right. And I've experienced that in some of the posts that I have written this, that have gone viral a, a little while ago. And then I was like, I feel so, that it's so important that you want to continue, but it became so draining that actually it became ineffective yeah. because there's at some point talking about it and trying to change other people when only the only person you can change is yourself. So why not concentrate on being the example rather than just discussing it? And I wonder if this is a almost a shift for you because you're kind of leaning into like, you know what, I'm going to buy you know, luxury hotel in Maldives and I'm going to become the first woman who owns this hotel. I'm going to be the woman that we need more women. I'm going to be the example so then I can pave the way for others. And just through that example, you can see that it's possible and then other women get on board. That's a more positive way of creating the change you talk about. Yeah, and there's so many ways to create change. Like I think we often think there is one way like oh we have to do this when I was younger I was very I very much cared 
about the world and I cared about animals so much. And I was like, I remember I was crying. I was married. I was like on a cruise with my husband. He spent $700 for each of us to go on a cruise. And at the time I was like, that is so much money. And I was like, I couldn't enjoy my life because I was on the cruise and I was like, oh my God, $700. I could donate that to a rescue and it could save all these animals. And then I was like, people are eating me. And then I start crying because I like, I'm so connected to animals. It's like, you know, imagine like a normal person, you love your dog. And if somebody killed your dog, you'd be devastated. That's how I feel about every single animal. It's really a draining. So I have to like cut myself off. Even now I have to cut myself off. I can't cry every time I go to dinner and somebody orders meat. That's not, I can't live like that. Like, you know, so I, I realized over time, like, yes, I, I do care about every animal and I do care about many people, not every person, but many people. And I just also need to care about myself and each of us can do a certain amount, but you, your, your amount is different than someone else's. And over the course of your life, it can be different. Maybe there's a period you spend a lot of time helping and there's a period where you don't. And maybe like you said, leading by example, it's a thing, or maybe like your child is the main person you're going to influence and they're going to, you know, have their entire life shaped by you. So I think it helped me so much caring less. And I know that's like, again, opposite of what we're supposed to do, but like caring too much was draining me and ruining my life. And like being like, you know what? I do care, but I, I also don't want to be miserable. So I give money. I donate to other, like so many people help animals like day to day. Like I follow this girl named Vanessa in Dubai. She has a baby, a newborn baby. She has like 20, 30, 40 cats in her house. She, so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to send her a little bit of money today. Right. I'm going to, I was visiting a cat shelter in Bali and I'm like, instead of me being the person every day with the cats, rescuing the cats, I just like paid off their vet bills. And I was like, you know what? You guys are the ones doing the daily exhausting work. I get to go do a podcast and go to lunch with my friends and I'm sending you money to keep like, you know, some people work with their time. Some people support with money. Um, or with like, if you're a lawyer, you do their law papers for them and you help the shelter or the whatever. Yeah. So I think that's really improved my life because I was just constantly miserable thinking I needed to spend every minute of my life helping people, which Mm. is not true Mm. and is not actually helpful because you will burn out earlier and you will help less people because you will give up and you will be sad all the time and ineffective. I think operating on, I don't want to say negative emotions because I'm trying to kind of think of emotions now as like neither positive nor negative, but the ones that are like very consuming that you do need to kind of calm down from operating in that way for period, like for consistently over long periods of time does like, you know, you you need to experience other emotions as well uh, to be able to be a fully functioning human being and just focusing on just one. I think it's really is really hard. Yeah. Um, with your YouTube channel, because obviously that was that that life. Is that something that you plan to return to, or pivot, no. or shift it, or? Unless I don't really have a plan with all of my channels. Essentially, they're mostly the only one I really am active on now. Active on stories, really not posting very frequently, is Instagram. Um, Facebook, which was a big channel for me, YouTube, Snapchat, I don't really use almost at all. If I do use them again in the future, I might. Maybe as like part of, maybe I'll decide, you know what, I'm going to use them just as like little poster boards and let people know what's happening once in a while. And if they like it, they like it. If they unfollow, they unfollow. It's fine. I totally get it. I'm not making the same type of content I made before. But realistically, I'm not really planning to go back. I don't really want to be a content creator. Like, the only downside is I do know it's nice for people. Like, and it helps them to, like you said, see another woman doing stuff and, like, see someone doing doing stuff that maybe not that many women get the chance to do or historically haven't had space to do. That's the only part where I'm like, ugh. I kind of want to post it. But at the same time, I'm like, you know what? I can go on other people's podcasts. I can go on other people's channels. I don't need to be the one creating the content. Mm -hmm. Someone else can create the content. I used to make videos about other people. Someone can make the video about me if they really, really want to. And I'm not shooting it or editing it or scripting it. I'm tired. I'm going to, I'm going to work on my wellness hotel and build a meditation chamber in the Maldives. So like, Mm. that's kind of my focus now. And I'm not planning to use social very much. Yeah. Mm. 
it's like life after being a content creator yeah. like what do you do after that <laughs> yeah I love yeah. it so much yeah mm. building the hotel is really fun um investing in friendships is really fun and um just like yeah learning how to meditate and I know it sounds lame like if you're a high schooler you're like oh my god I want to be a youtuber and I think some some things you get them and then you're like that was enough like mm. you know it's like tiramisu I love tiramisu I don't eat it every meal right maybe you have an era you eat the same thing for breakfast for three years and then you shift I'm kind of done with my content era I'm just kind of like mm. the itch has been scratched I did it yay uh now I want to uh build the reason I want to build hotels is to create spaces for people to connect in person I really love hosting retreats for women and I was hosting retreats at these retreat centers and none of them were really built correctly for what I wanted. And that's how I started creating content is I was like watching content and I wasn't seeing the videos I wanted to see. And I was like pointing my finger and I was like, why aren't you making content about this? Why are, and I was like, Aline, you can make it. Stop complaining about other people make the content. And that's how I feel now about hotels and mm -hmm. gathering spaces. I was like, I want a place I can go with my digital nomad friends and just kind of escape and do red light masks and do saunas and ice baths and go swimming in the ocean and reconnect with nature and be away from people and mm -hmm. I just was like I'll just make it myself <laughs> instead of what was missing you said something was missing when you were looking for something like this what was missing specifically with the content or with the with hotels? the hotels so when I was hosting retreats so I host retreats female entrepreneurs usually 22 women so most locations I noticed are very uh simple for retreats they're too simple or they're the, the areas are not designed well like for example if we do daily chats like we do a class called let's talk money it's like a three-hour financial breakdown everybody says their net worth we look at their savings their investments it's like hot and you're hot so I go to this beautiful place in Jamaica. It's an amazing property. I love it. But there's no AC in the common areas. So we're all these like adult women sweating in the middle of Jamaican summer, suffering. And I'm like, I just wanted, I like, if they got an air conditioner in that living room, I probably would not have built a retreat center. I would just keep going there. And then, but then I was like, I asked them three years in a row. I was like, can you get AC in this room for three years? They never got AC. And I was like, okay, I'm building, I'm building my own place. Like mm -hmm. I need AC for these women. And also just like, um, just having a place like that's my home because I am a digital nomad. I do have a parent in Israel. I do have a parent in LA so far from each other, opposite sides of the world. I want like a place that's mine. I want to rescue cats, but I don't live anywhere because I travel full time. And I, I was like, okay, if I build this hotel, we're building a cat rescue behind it, by the way. And we're going to take so many cats from all over the Maldives and put them in the cat rescue. That's like my main motivation is it's actually a cat rescue. We're pretending it's a hotel. Um, and just like, okay, I can have my cats there. The staff will take care of them all year. I can rescue cats. I can have a place that's my home. I can move my stuff there. I can build a house behind the hotel. Um, I can have my friends come. It's 24 villas and every villa is private. So people can have privacy, but I'm designing all the common areas to be friendly so most hotels, I've gone to a lot of fancy hotels the last seven years as a content creator. I get flown to the nicest hotels in the world. And I was like, I don't like this. Like, I want to make friends. Like, I, we're sitting at these tables with other cool people and, like, mm. so isolated. And I want to talk to people and I want to hang out and I want to do, like, social stuff. And so that's what the project is. It's essentially private villas, privacy. I love privacy. My private time. <laughs> but then also in the social areas, like, healthy food, like like mostly vegetarian food, um, like a healthy lifestyle that's very social because mm -hmm. that's like what I want. I want like a little fancy commune <laughs> essentially where right, you can right, come right. in and out. Yeah, no, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the hotel sounds incredible. Um, and like the concept of connecting with people in real time together, that sense of connection, I think that's what's missing in our life now. And I'm very excited for for this, you know, part of your life and like reinventing and going into this direction that feels right for you. Um, what seems impossible to you now that if it were to happen will change the course of your life and your business? I think something I I think in a, a little bit feels impossible like a pipe dream is with the hotels 
growing it into something bigger, like making this something all around the world. Like if this one goes really well, like building bigger ones in like different parts of the world. So it's more accessible for different people. And that just seems kind of impossible. Like honestly, building a hotel kind of seemed impossible, <laughs> uh, but here we are. And then also me and my partner are like, we have all these like secret plans. We're like, this is just a test project. Like this people are like, Oh, this is your end project. And we're both like, no, no, no. This is just like the test project. This is like a little test microcosm and if it goes well then we'll like buy a whole other private island we'll buy this we'll buy that and not for the sake of being like oh we're fancy we have hotels and islands but like genuinely to like because what I wanted when I was younger when I was like 18 I was like I want an apartment in every big city so I can like have a home in different places around the world and like when I think about it I'm like oh it's too complicated like I have to do it as Airbnb it's annoying it's confusing but now I'm like wait if I have like a hotel all around the world like, if you look at a Marriott, people love Marriott because they feel like it's their little home in every city. And I just don't connect with the Marriott brand or these big box brands. I don't like them. I don't like the vibe. And so I want to create one where I'm like, this has like the boutique hotel energy, like the small home energy, but like everywhere for all the people like me who do travel so much and want like that little home feeling around the world. That seems like impossible. Mm. But um, but talking about like try. also buying buying a hotel like how do you do that well we're building it or it's from like the buying ground the, up buying the land like yeah. how do you do that <laughs> I mean you know it's 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 a lot of work but like it's possible mm -hmm. it's kind of like if you want to learn how to like build a car at first you're like this seems impossible what are all these little pieces but then you build it and you're like oh I have a car I built a car right so the same with the hotel like you just have to follow the steps, right? So, okay, we need to find a location. We need to choose land. We need to bid for the land. We need to win the bid. We need to get permissions from the government. We need to create a, we need to get an architect. It's just a series of steps, essentially. And I was like, okay, well, if other people have followed these steps, I can follow them too. And if I fail, then worst case scenario, I have a giant empty hotel in a beautiful place that I can just meditate in lie in by myself <laughs> in the ruins so. so how do you get to attend how do you get to go to this magical place of yours oh well it's going to open in one year so in the summer fall of 2025 and it's designed in a way that's going to be very we're not calling it a women's only hotel but it's very feminine so we're gonna have things that girls like we're gonna have little packets for when you're on your period that can be brought to your room we're gonna have dyson blow dryers for everybody even though it's humid and your hair will coral immediately so we'll have it, the look, it can look nice for a time within an air-conditioned room, room. Yeah. <laughs> um so that will be next year and it, it will just be open i think we'll only be taking direct bookings on our website which i think is going to be nunuisland.com n-o-u-n-o-u island and I don't know if we're going to go on booking websites. We're leaving it open for now. It's not like a membership hotel. Anyone can come and book. Um, and we're going to host retreats there as well. So if you want to come and have a one week like retreat experience and meet other people that are like minded, there will be themes and the retreats you need to apply for. So we make sure everybody who comes to the retreats are on the same energetic state. Mm. Yeah. So you can go alone. You can make friends there. You can go with friends. You can go with your partner. We can go on a retreat and it'll be open amazing. next year. Yeah. And I'll be there. Because <laughs> I just want to hang out there all the time. So. <laughs> well, I wish you all the best with that. I mean, Thank that sounds you. like um, an incredible new venture and, you know, an amazing different pivot, but something that kind of brings all of your, I guess, your, your superpowers and things that you're passionate about in, in one yeah. place. So um, exactly. really looking forward to that. And thank you so yeah. much for coming onto the show. Of course. So thank nice you for to meet you. Me. It was, it's been amazing. Thank you. <laughs> You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. If you love listening to these inspiring leadership stories from all walks of life and would like to support our show, the best thing you can do is to subscribe or follow wherever you are listening. Thank you so much. And I'll see you in the next episode.